Okay. Uh, just a quick recap after last week. What did we do? You saw that work from Kittleton and Prescott, which is an unusual pair of people for me to compliment. Uh, statistical arguments that, base, that, that contradict the money multiplier theory of how money is created. So base money follows the cycle, credit money leads it, the opposite of the conventional model. And it, what they are are the same as the predictions of the endogenous money school. And if you look at the way people think about money, there are two extremes. One is you've got a vertical supply curve in the ISLM model, which I pointed out last week is not a Keynesian model. It's a neoclassical model developed by Hicks before he saw read the general theory. Uh, and then there's the endogenous money, which if you see the simple ways that people characterise it graphically, which is the first way it was done, that's drawn not as a vertical money supply, but a horizontal money supply. Now, that is just a character, a caricature of, both, both are a caricature of the arguments. Okay? Fundamentally, what one says is that the, a non-market entity controls the amount of money in the economy, and the second one, endogenous, says that somehow the market system itself controls the money. It doesn't have to be a vertical line or a horizontal line. It's just a characterisation using the limited tools economists normally use of what it means to say money is endogenous. Now, a bit of a quick aside, I'm putting this back in the last, last week's lectures in previous year and in following years. This is a bit more on why the money multiplier doesn't work, written by a guy who was then the vice president of the Federal Reserve in, in New York, back in the days when monetarism was becoming dominant. And he had to fend off people who were saying you should be trying to control the money supply and they thought it was an easy thing to do. And he was saying, well, the belief that you can control it is based on a naive assumption okay, that the banking sector only expands loans after the reserves have been put into the system somehow. He says in the real world, this is a simple little summary, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process and look for the reserves later. So I had that in last week's lecture. But he elaborates then a, a bit more. So I want to capture the elaboration here. I think it's one of the most realistic and empirically based, experience based arguments about why the money multiplier argument doesn't make any sense. He says, because they have to accommodate, he said they've got to accommodate the demand for reserves. Uh, and the reserves that are required are actually determined by what the deposits that are there two weeks earlier. That may well have changed in recent years, but writing back in 1969, there was a two week time lag. Now, if you have loans creating deposits, then there's money in the system which can be borrowed for any bank that finds itself on its reserve limit later on. So the actual process of creating loans and deposits also generates money which can turn up as reserves in the banking sector later. And he says excess, reserve, excess reserves normally at frictional levels. The total level of reserves is pretty much predetermined. So they're not a control mechanism. And he says since they've got to meet their reserve requirements uh, each week and they can't affect the reserves they've got that week, the total amount has to be available, compulsory. You have to provide those reserves. You said you've got some, the Federal Reserve has some discretion about how it might do that if necessary. Uh, they can do it by open market operations or, may, uh, getting, or borrowing from another member bank. But there is no discretion. He said, so the suggestion that you could actually use open market operations or other short term mechanisms to control reserves, he said, is completely illogical. He said, the reserves simply have to be there. So it's, again, it's not that they're a control system telling the cars how to drive down the highway, they're an ambulance coming up and picking up the accidents later. And that's the paper, you can search on the web and find it, I'll put it up on the, blog, on the uh, view site at some stage, but it's a very detailed, realistic, empirical, experience-based argument about why money model that doesn't work and why you can't use reserves to control deposits or loans. And then Moore goes on to explain uh, where the do the supply of loans is determined by largely by the demand for credit. So the basic argument of endogenous money is the commercial sector itself, and including the banks in that idea of a commercial sector at the moment, determines the level of money in the system. And it can therefore expand or contract regardless of government policy. Now, of course, if you have money being created by the banking sector in a commercial uh, system, that carries debt obligations, which fiat money and, and the, the fiction of commodity money, which really has never properly existed, uh, cannot, don't carry those debt obligations. So once you're looking at credit money, you've got to also look at the dynamics of debt to have an idea of how the monetary system functions. And that therefore means that what the financial sector as a part of the overall commercial system does 
is a crucial part of the economy. Now, I see the endogenous money case as quite persuasive at a prima facie level, but within that, it's, it's still a very early area. The first person to write on this was, uh, in, in a detailed sense was Basil Moore, writing back in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it is still very much a, a nascent area. It's not, a, not an easily worked out area where everybody agrees with each other for a start. So there's plenty of arguments within the field. And some of these I'll get onto at a, at a, at a, at a more systemic level later. There's also the very simple basic stuff, which is says, how do you define money? Now that's also an issue for the endogenous money case, exogenous money case. If you think of Milton Friedman's uh, definition, money's what falls out of the Federal Reserve's helicopter as it flies over the country. Pretty simplistic model. Uh, we want to be slightly more realistic than that. Uh, what's the origin of money? Now some uh, non-orthodox economists, who are largely seen as post-Keynesian as I'm largely regarded, argue the state was necessary for the creation of money in the first instance. And they make that a major part of they, how they then argue to what happens today. So the origin of money, they argue, this, this is largely the chartalist case or the so-called modern monetary theory group. Uh, they argue very vehemently that the state was necessary to create money and therefore that affects how money is used now, uh, created now. I see it as largely irrelevant, but ironically, there's now some recent research by an uh, anthropologist called David Graeber in a book called Debt, the First 5,000 Years, which is pretty much implying debt began 3,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, argues that the, the way it was created had nothing to do with any of the creation myths that economists have. Both the Austrians' arguments about it evolving out of the barter system and the neoclassical the same, and also the modern monetary crowd who believe it was created by an entity one, one could call the state and done so that you could actually tax the populace. That none of those make any sense when you look at the anthropological record. So if they actually, fun, ironically enough, if those arguments are important to Austrians or the modern monetary crowd, that's a reason to criticise their modern theories, not support them. But I'll get onto that later in, in, in later lectures. I'm still reading Graeber's book. Within the post-Keynesian school, as I said, the way it was first characterised was to say that you could, rather than drawing the vertical line of the money supply in the ISLM model, you draw a horizontal one. Now, some of you had um, Neil Harp from Macro would have seen Neil do a version of the ISLM curve using a horizontal. Am I correct there? Okay. Okay. Well, that question of how horizontal is that supply became an issue within post-Keynesian economics. Again, I think this is partly a problem with the way they characterised it because you can't do justice to a monetary system using a set of intersecting lines, whether they're vertical, horizontal or sideways. But that's, that's became part of the debate. And then the relationship between money and credit. They are different. Uh, and then how the credit system itself works to expand and contract during burns and slumps. And finally, this comes down to a large part of the Chartalist case these days, whether you prevent crises using the government money supply whether what the government does can prevent a crisis in, the, in a market system, and how you measure it. That's a range of some of the things which are still being disputed. And a few of them, as I've said, I come back to thinking they're not particularly important. I don't think how money is created in the very first instance 5,000 years ago particularly matters for how it's used now. But that puts me outside some of the others, so I've, I've got to acknowledge what the arguments are. OK, if you look at the neoclassical case and they ask what is money, they'll often say it's a means of payment and a store of value. Now remember, last week I gave you Keynes sending up neoclassical saying it's a store of value when their model presumes no uncertainty about the future or that you can use risk to estimate the future, in which case you don't really need it as a store of value, you're far better off putting your money in bonds that'll give you a return or shares. So, but the first part still remains that neoclassicals largely see money just as a way of making barter, which they think is what's actually going on in capitalism, easier. So the means of payments, the essential focus of the neoclassical case, and that pretty much says that what e the economy is really about is consumption. Now, the other extreme, which is the endogenous money end of the spectrum, Marx gave the best expression here and said, oh, yes, OK, you've got to actually have consumption for capitalism to work, but that's not, not what drives capitalism. What really drives it is the desire of capitalists to accumulate wealth. And he puts this in his, one of his classical... Uh, um, dramatic lines in volume one of Capital, accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. That's what drives the system. And he said, in that case, the store of value side, which is hard to explain in the neoclassical and pretty much on its side, uh, is vital because what matters to capitalists is not consumption, it's the abstract amount of money they accumulate. 
Okay? And money gives you an abstract measure of the amount of wealth you've got in a capitalist system. If you go back to the days of the feudal system, you might have measured wealth in terms of how much gold you've got inside your bullion chest, or how many peasants are working in your fields, or how many knights you can put into the field in a battle. But in capitalism, it's the number of dollars in your bank account. The number of zeros tells you how important you are. And Marx argued that the main uh, role of money is that the, the, the drive to accumulate money is what drives the entire system. So yes, use value matters, but in particular what matters is what he called surplus value, which we largely these days call profit. He said that's the driving motive of capitalist production, and it's a pretty conception. In other words, it's self-deception to argue that uh, it's just a system for satisfying the direct needs of the consumers, the consumption of the actual producers. So in this vision, the store of value is essential, and since I'm putting across the endogenous money case, that's what I'll emphasise, the role of, ca of money not just as a means of, of, uh, of uh, facilitating exchange, but also as a way you show your accumulation of wealth. Origin of money. Well, um, I'd argue that you can reasonably argue that it doesn't particularly matter how money evolved in the first place, because just as flight evolved by what dinosaurs managed to do maybe 250 million years ago, uh, that doesn't particularly affect what we do today with a Saturn V rocket. Now one led to the other, but what the dinosaurs could do doesn't limit what a Saturn V rocket can do. We don't yet know of any dinosaurs that flew to the moon who have managed to get there, and thank God the sceptics have had their uh, legs shot out underneath them by the photographs that NASA's put up in the last few days of the actual tracks of humans walking on the moon. But people nonetheless do have let the beliefs they have about how money was created affect how they define and interpret money today. And there's two extreme positions uh, within the spectrum of, of, of the, the uh, endogenous money case. One is that money originated in commercial exchange, the other that it was invented by the state for payment of taxes. Now the latter is the charterless case. I lean more towards the former, but interestingly enough, Graeber argues as a professor of anthropology, and so does Michael Hudson, who did a PhD in archaeology before he did his economics, that it was a combined uh, a mixture of commercial and control systems that gave rise to money. And in fact, Graeber argues that a major part of the evolution of money was to get a, a means of measuring levels of punishment for crimes. You see it coming out of the legal system. So that's got nothing to do with the case that either of the uh, extremes in the post-Keynesian discussion have done. Now, the latter approach, of course, is saying it's for the state, emphasises the state's role today. The former emphasises the role of the pure credit system. I lean towards the, the latter of those, also the former approach, the um, money originating commercial exchange, but it doesn't particularly matter to me. I think I, I see it as important to start in saying how capitalism functions and then talk about the state's role on top of that later. Rather than the chartalist argument, you've got to start with state money and, and at some stage, one of these decades, they might add in commercial uh, credit created money to their formal modelling. What does Keynes think? Well, this comes down to a, a major issue in the endogenous money cap because many of them, almost all of them, are affected by Keynes in some way. The trouble with Keynes is quite confusing. If you read the general theory, it's a bit like reading the Bible. If you want to find a particular argument, turn to the right page. Okay? You can find virtually any extreme you like. Um, and partly that arises from the fact that Keynes was still escaping from thinking like a neoclassical when he wrote the book, because he was taught, I think actually by Marshall, certainly the school of Marshall. So he was, you couldn't get a more neoclassical orientation than that. And he was still escaping from those ideas as he wrote the general theory, and there was a developmental sense to it as well. And he'd often also take a debating approach. He'd often say, I'm going to assume what my critics uh, assume and still prove them wrong. Now when you read it, you might think he actually agrees with the assumption, but he doesn't. He's saying it doesn't lead to the conclusion you think it does, and I think something different anyway. So it's very hard with that mix mixture of things to work out what Keynes actually thought. Did he believe the money supply was exogenous or endogenous? If you want to support one case or the other, you can find both of them in the general theory. So here's a quote uh, that is straight out of ISLM. I'll jump over that. Uh, this is a very boring way of talking about it is, is where he's verbally putting together a model that you might see Hicks as saying that's the basis for ISLM. So Hicks had some justification for saying what he thought was Keynes' model was similar to the one he developed back in the early 1930s. 
Uh, but down the bottom, the third element that Keynes has got in this verbal sketch of a model is, say, the quantity of money as determined by the action of the central bank. Well, that's clearly exogenous money. On the other hand, turn to page 84 of the general theory and you see this statement, the amount of cash that the banking system has created. Now, that arguably is endogenous money. Uh, Sheila Dow's done a, a lovely little piece about uh, Keynes's views on, uh, on money uh, in, for a, a book commemorating the general theory, and he says one of the finds she, she found was that he, Keynes says money is created by a relaxation of the conditions of credit by the banking system, which again is implying it's the endogenous actions of the banking sector, not the actions of the central bank. And Keynes says will take the latter as typical. So you've got, uh, in the general theory, you've got Keynes midway between the two arguments. And what I like to highlight is the 1937 papers because Keynes developed the general theory largely with working with a group of like-minded people in, in Cambridge, the Cambridge Circus, I think he called it. And they were debating ideas backwards and forwards but within one particular Keynes-dominated way of thinking. When the general theory was published, people who were outside that circus got to read it, they wrote their own interpretations, and Keynes saw how totally wrong some of them got those interpretations, but he also got some ideas he hadn't thought of before. So I find the 37 papers is a better exp ex exposition of what Keynes thought than what you find in the, um, in the general theory. Now, that's, I'll come back to that later, but Dow also argues that there are changes to the nature of banking since Keynes's time, that if whatever Keynes might have thought, the system has become more endogenous since. Now, to some extent, this argument that, Dow, that Steele goes through of a, of a stage of development from a previous form of money to this form we have today involves some of the same creation myths. So she doesn't talk about the first two or three <coughs> stages, but she's pretty much thinking in terms of commodity money, then fiat money, then fractional banking as the first three stages. We may be historically wrong, as Graeber argues. But by stage four, she's saying banks can increase the money multiplier, but they've still got a multiple constrained by the volume of bank reserves. Now, that's thinking very much in neoclassical money, uh, money multiplier terms. But that's only a, a, a progression. She's saying in stage four, the, bank, the, the central bank becomes a lender of last resort, and that means that uh, commercial banks are no longer constrained by the stock of reserves. Um, she then goes into stage five, which is liability management, which is a new element in how the monetary system functions. That's where you've got banks not merely issuing loans and creating deposits, but also creating securities, selling those, buying and selling uh, money on the wholesale market, or buying and selling repurchase agreements and getting money out of that from other organisations. So that's what she said, is that's more endogenous than what Keynes was talking about. Um, but here we get into the argument between the vertical and horizontal supply curves. Again, I think this is a limitation of how post-Keynesian economists thought at the time, but they, don't, they do not know the right tools for modelling dynamics, which is one reason I'm glad to have engineers in the room who do. Uh, but that's where she's talking about if you have the exogenous case, then you draw a vertical line for supply, and therefore you say that the banks are passive because the government's setting everything, or you draw a horizontal line and you say the banks are passive because the commercial sector is determining the amount being supplied because you have a horizontal supply curve and the amount demand that depends on where the demand curve is, the two lines intersect. It's in both cases you're still saying banks are passive. That I think is a distortion coming out of how they're trying to represent this very dynamic process in a very static way. Then she's talking about the growth of the euro market. Stage six is securitization, so that's where you actually bundle loans together, sell them to somebody else, get them off your books and get a chance to create more more debt again, so that expands the endogenous credit capacity of the banking sector. And finally, market diffusion. You get things where like companies like Aldi are trying to muscle in on credit cards and Woolworths and Coles and so on in the money and, and debt creation process. So she's seeing a progression over time making the system more endogenous than Keynes said it was in his day, even if he was caught halfway between saying exogenous and endogenous then. The next thing is just this whole idea of the, what was called horizontalism. That's the way Basil Moore first put it across. How, how tenable is that? And it's known as horizontalism, again, for the reason that that's how Basil first represented. Rather than a vertical money supply for the ISLM, you put in a horizontal one and then see what your demand comes out of that. And that says the supply of credit by banks is unlimited at the given interest rate. So demand expands, 
they'll provide the additional credit without changing the interest rate, which largely the, that's what the, the uh, Federal Reserve can control. Now that's again putting banks across as passive. And Dow argues here that banks obviously have some role in setting the supply, they're not totally passive. Now Basil Moore would not have disagreed with that. Again, it comes down to the way that it was characterised. But it led to a, what I see as a bit of a, a bit of a waste of time debate that's still important to, to show you that how to read some of the literature you'll be reading as this part of the course. So even though Basil said there is no independent supply curve, that doesn't mean that banks have no role in determining how much credit is supplied. Now, and of course we, we, we know the basic idea of saying that bank, banks can uh, limit credit by credit rationing at various times, which we're certainly seeing happen right now. So she criticised Basil's argument that the money system was entirely endogenous on the basis of lines of credit. And here's a bit of a furphy because she chooses this particular fairly simple set of stats here to say that over that time period, overdrafts that are like a line of credit declined from 22% to 14%. I think it's a bit of a cheap job there because look at the dates she's using, 1984 to 1992. 84 was the beginning of one of the big bubbles globally. We had Alan Bond and Christopher Scase as our local representative, but there was a big bubble that led to the stock market crash of 87. 1992 is the middle of the, of the very, very steep recession that occurred afterwards. I think it's a pretty kludgy use of, of numbers there. Sorry about that, Sheila. Um, now, she does go through and qualify the position that the way Basel work was interpreted, first of all, of saying total apparent passiveness. They have some capacity to limit credit supplies. And of course, their willingness to lend collapses during the slump, and we're seeing that right now. Um, that doesn't qualify the overall endogeneity. It just says that the endogenous process involves both the banks and the commercial sector, and also households potentially, as we've seen recently, in how much credit is created. So you get they're active in an endogenous framework rather than passive. It's not saying that they're not endogenous. And what it implies, of course, is more cyclical behaviour, because banks are likely to want to extend credit during a boom knocking on your door, offering your credit cards, and restricted supply during a slump, which will amplify what the commercial sector itself will do in the same circumstances. So they can help accelerate the expansion of credit during a boom and accelerate its collapse during a slump, and we've certainly seen that uh, in the recent history. Next is a thing called liquidity preference. And I think Sheila's got a lovely summary of what that actually means, and we're seeing it dramatically right now in the way the stock market's behaving. Liquidity preference is the preference for short-term over long-term assets. When you're comfortable about your expectations about the future and things are, credit markets are rising, you're very happy to have lots of assets tied up in shares and bonds. When you start to get panicky about the future, liquidate, liquidate, liquidate becomes Moses and the profits. And we've seen that in the last few days. So people taking 3.5% haircuts on the value of their shares in one day to get out of the market. And I don't think it's over yet by any means. Now that is still compatible with saying the demand for, the, the demand for money determines the supply. It's just saying they've got their own lending preferences as well. And again we saw that in the collapse of Lerman Brothers and all that particular period, and we're seeing it again now as well. Banks which are very happy to swap re what are called repo agreements with each other, re repurchase agreements, where they sell something as a bond, get cash and agree to buy it back at a later date. That evaporated during this crisis in 2007 because you thought you might actually uh, you know, buy one of these things off somebody, give them money, and then they fold a day later and you don't get your money back. So their preference for short-term, i.e. cash, over repos, which were incredibly short-term themselves, also went through the roof. So banks, therefore, have some sort of control. We've got to have a mixed... If we're going to try to model this, we have to have both the banks and the borrowers having some say in how much money is created. Now, when she tried to model this in the paper, in the tribute to the general theory, uh, she used a series of diagrams, and there's no criticism of Sheila to say they were clumsy because that's exactly what she said herself. In trying to do it, she came through and finally said, the limitations of a diagrammatic representation of a non-deterministic organic process become very clear. Couldn't agree more, which is why I'm trying to develop a different framework that I'll start showing you in the next half of this lecture. You need dynamic models, models that you can't draw on a piece of paper to characterise this, but the way you've been taught as economists gets you to think in terms of pieces of paper. So I'll go through that not only the next lecture, the next half of this lecture, I'll start touching on that.
So what she's really saying isn't that you know, money's not endogenous, it's exogenous. What she's saying is that credit institutions themselves have some role determining how much money is created. And so the finally, again, a very good summary, the volume of credit is jointly determined by the central bank, the banks, and the non-bank public. So you really need a model of money creation that includes all three. What I'll be showing you in this, this particular year of the course will be just one where I've got the banks and the non-bank public. I'm leaving the central bank out but I'm bringing that in in future models, and that's one reason I set that essay for you. A bit of experimentation there. Now, to me, the main group that actually made it possible to really develop a, a, a true model of money creation was the circuit school in Europe. And uh, this is, this is, most economics has been dominated by what's done in America or England. This was people working in both, mainly Italy, but also France, to some extent Germany. And what they focused on was what they called the circuit by which debt-based money is created when a loan is made and then circulates through the economy. And again, it argues that a monetary economy is fundamentally different to a barter economy. Now, Keynes said that in the general theory, but then continued to say that money only occurs in the background and plays no formal role in his model. That was a mistake. He should have had it in his formal model. But the really question of how do you bring it in and what I like about the, uh, the, the circuit school is they show that you can bring it in and you can't do it the way the neoclassicals and also to some extent what are called Sraffian economists have tried to do. We simply have a commodity model and then you bring in money as an additional commodity. Um, and this argument also, as Sheila was saying, sees banks as active in the system. They've got to approve a loan before the money turns up in the system itself. Now the major writer in this field is a a uh, wonderful Italian uh, professor called Augusto Graziani. I think he very, very much fits the name Augusto. Uh, he's one of the only human beings I've ever seen who can stand up and give a talk impromptu in his second language, which is English, and state his talk entirely in perfectly formed paragraphs. I fall over my own words when I talk in English, so I, I doff my hat to Augusto's capacity to extemporise. Um, I've got to say that first of all, I'm going to be criticising him later. So I want to put it in context. I think he's done some brilliant work. Now, in the paper that I've set for the readings, he ignores the creation of fiat money. He talks about having a central bank in the system, but in fact, when you look at the model he builds, the verbal model, he doesn't have a central bank at all. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm building a model of a pure credit economy. The first person who spoke of that was Vixel, which is also one of the readings I've got there. So what he actually talks about is how one might model a monetary system without a central bank. Can it happen? Now, he starts by saying money is essentially different to credit. And that's really, I think, where the deep insights came from, this difference between credit and money. Because he says, if you have a credit system, then at the end of the period, there's still an obligation between the buyer and the seller. If you imagine yourself being a small tra you know, tradie, uh, you know, a sparky or a, or a plumber going to Bunnings, and you can buy some of the gear you need on what's called trade credit. Does anybody work for a firm that like that here? A few, okay, you should buy stuff on trade credit. And that means when you might have an account at Bunning that says you can take goods up to the value of $1,000, let's say, uh, on your trade credit account. So you go there, you take the pipes, you go out, you paid $1,000 in trade credit, but not actually exchange money. Now at the end of the 30-day period, if it's 30 days on Bunnings, you've got to then pay money for that. If you don't, you owe Bunnings. Whereas, so that's a credit transaction which you can buy goods with, but you still owe goods, that you still owe money at the end. You only terminate it by paying money. So, that, so there's an essential difference between credit and money in this system. So you've got to distinguish the two. So he said, okay, how do we get money in a system where it's created out of a credit system? He says, first of all, there has to be a token. And that's a remarkably simple, but remarkably deep insight, because he said, if you have a commodity money, then all you're really doing is saying you're going to use a particular commodity as your unit of exchange. But that means if anybody wanted that commodity, they could go and make it for themselves. If we use gold, you can go, you know, go out to Bathurst, get a shovel, dig a hole, get a pan, find a few effects of gold, you can make your own money. He said that is really still a barter system. You might describe it as money, but it's fundamentally still barter. It's rather than going from having N goods in your system, you've got N plus one. It's not a qualitative change. So he said, first of all, you must be therefore using a token, something that is intrinsically worthless and which you can't make yourself. You have to get it from whatever part of the system is creating the money. 
Second thing, he says it has to be final settlement, otherwise we're talking things like trade credit. So even though you can buy stuff using Bunnings trade credit, it's not money because it doesn't terminate the transaction between the buyer and the seller. And the third issue is it can't grant rights of seniorage, meaning that agents, the person or the agent in the system that has the right to produce it can't then use it to go shopping themselves. If they're going to use any of the money created, they've got to earn it themselves as well in whatever role they have in the system. So if you have a seller A and a buyer B issue, accepting tokens that are issued by a bank, that bank can't just go print the tokens it needs to go and buy stuff from A or B. It's got to earn those tokens somehow itself, even though it was the initial creator of it, because otherwise it's like buying stuff on IOUs and you're back in a credit system, not a monetary system. So Graziani concludes from all that, the only way that you can do that is to have promises, the, the payments made by means of the promises of a third agent. And that I think is a, another piece of brilliance here, because what they're saying is all transactions in a monetary economy are, are three-sided. And that's a fundamental shift from the neoclassical way of thinking about money, that there's two sides and two commodities. So what you have is banks now are an essential side of capitalism. You have a buyer, a seller and a banker, effectively in every transaction, even if we're using paper notes to, to transfer the money. Now, the argument he puts in the, in, in the paper is that, that when an agent satisfies payment by means of a cheque, it's the promise of the bank to pay the bearer of that cheque that's being transferred. And that is accepted by the seller as a complete extinguishment of the obligations between the two, as long as the cheque doesn't bounce, as long as there's actually money in the account. So once you make payment that way, there's no more relationship between buyer and seller. But one is now a creditor of the bank and the other is a debtor of the same bank. And he said that means that there's no sense of privilege to the agents involved in the, in the purchase. Uh, so he said, therefore, for this to apply, every transaction in a monetary system is triangular. There's a buyer, a seller, and a bank that records the transaction effectively, whether that's by monetary paper transfers or by actually electronic transfers as we do today, which are much more that way of, of, uh, of thinking. We, we know that therefore that when you buy something on eBay or you buy something um, by making a direct debit, you literally are transferring your money from one account to another. Okay? It's so he so said the, the essential point of this school of thought is the minimum number of agents in a capital system of three, not two. So you sell A with a commodity to sell, buy a B who has money in a bank account, and wait, here we go, and a bank that records the transfer. Those are your three essential elements. Now that's essentially different from the neoclassical barter vision, which pretty much says you have two agents and two commodities, even if they pretend there's such a thing as a money commodity, because each person in the, in the neoclassical vision is a buyer stroke seller, who's got one commodity and wants another, the other person is in the opposite direction, uh, and all that you do is they haggle over an exchange rate, uh, or they sell, the, you know, they sell one commodity to get the money commodity and then transfer to the other. There's no bank. Now, in a sense, that's an interesting vision not, a, not, a, not of a primitive village, by the way, according to Graeber, but a couple of primitive tribes that normally would be uh, uh, stabbing each other and get together for an, an occasional ritual exchanges. It doesn't actually happen inside the village. The village would have a much more sophisticated, socially based way of allocating goods between people. But it's not a model of capitalism. It's not what happens in capitalism. So barter is a two-sided, two-commodity exchange. Person A gives person B units of X in return for units of Y. If you call one the money commodity, it's just, it's just semantics. It's not actually bringing in a money system. So here's A who wants to flog digital cameras and B who wants to flog apples. They work out some sort of exchange rate. That's the end of it. So the essential insight to begin with is money is not a commodity. It's a non-commodity. It's essential to capitalism, but it's not a commodity. And Again, to quote Graziani once more, true monetary economy must therefore be using token money, which is nowadays a paper currency. Of course, we're now going from paper to electronic. So it's three-sided, single commodity, financial exchanges. That's what we have to model. Person A gives person B units of X in return for B transferring money by commanding a bank to make a a transfer from one account to the other. So here's A 
flocking digital cameras for as, as before to B, and what B does is say, tell the bank, Z, make a transfer from my account across to A's account. That's what we have to model. So all exchanges are three-sided, and you also can't lump firms and banks together, which is one thing that not just neoclassicals do, but I also argue to a large extent the modern monetary school do by not properly differentiating the banking sector from the commercial sector. So Richard Grossing only puts it very strongly. He said banks and firms must be considered as two distinct kinds of agents. He said firms are buyers and sellers of commodities and they use banks to perform payments. Banks, on the other hand, produce means of payment and acts of clearing houses. You, have, you cannot aggregate them into one single sector. Now, that's great. I think it's a, a fabulous starting point and it's developed from a very sens sensible set of first principles, reasons why you can't use the neoclassical approach, it just isn't modelling capitalism. But, and also why monetary economy is fundamentally different. Keynes couldn't quite explain it. Here's, I think, a brilliant explanation by Graziani. Unfortunately, from that point on, problems arise when Graziani and the people who work in the circuit school attempted to build a model of the economy from that foundation because, unfortunately, they've been trained by neoclassical economists and they haven't been taught the essential tools of dynamic modelling that they get if they're taught by engineers or taught by mathematicians about the tools that can be used. So they don't actually have the insights, they don't actually have the mathematics needed. They go back to what they basically learned during their own courses like you guys have, uh, where you've been taught by neoclassical economists, you haven't learned differential equations, you think everything is a couple of intersecting lines. Uh, and also you don't know how to carefully watch, keep track of dimensions, so you therefore make mistakes in confusing stocks and flows, which is a very easy thing to do. It's not a straightforward issue at all, verbally, to keep track of whether you're talking about a stock of something or the flow of something from that stock. So what he does is goes on to a, a time-based verbal discussion of the sequence of transactions that occur in what he calls the creation and destruction of money. Now, notice I've got a question mark there for very good reason. Um, he starts from his simplest model where he's only got capitalist workers and banks. There's no central bank, though he does talk about it. And he reaches a series of conclusions which I think are easily shown to be false using good dynamic logic. Um, and what I do on, when I go through the, talking about his verbal argument, wherever I think there's something questionable, I'm going to put a question mark inside there to show you why. Now next week I'll show you how to develop a model that fixes all those errors. And let's take a break from this, uh, the second half of